Good evening, everyone. I'm Will Milberg. I'm the Dean of the New School for Social Research, and uh, we'll get started in a minute. We're going to begin by offering the mic to the New School Cafeteria Occupation Group and the Communist Student Group. Thank you so much, guests, workers, students, faculty. We are here on the former land of the Lene Lenape people. And so first, I would like to acknowledge that in addition to the occupation, which is attempting to prefigure a different world, we are also on occupied territory. And we are going to attempt in this space to honor the people who still live here and whose legacy we hope to continue in a different manner. Thank you, Dean Milberg. Thank you, Mr. Varoufakis, for inviting us to say a few words. My name is Eli. I'm a PhD student in politics at the New School and a worker, and I have been for seven years. It's a privilege to be a worker here, and we would like very much to get back to work. In order for us to do that, in order for the cafeteria workers to do that, it is essential that we have contracts that honor our existence, that allow allow us to continue with our existence, that give fair wages, that give health care, that give provisions for child care, that in fact give provisions for people who work here and who have given themselves to this school for multiple years, for decades in some cases, to have tuition remission in the same way that other people who are employed here full time do. So we are just here to say thank you so much for being part of this. Thank you very much for this space. And please Please help us maintain this occupation of the cafeteria as a way to prefigure a different way of being. It is under capitalist unfreedom that we are here. It is for that reason that we love our jobs. It's not the jobs we love. It's not the wage dependency. It is our connection with each other that this occupation of the cafeteria makes possible in a better way. Thank you all very much. So uh, basically the situation is that the new school has been contracting out their cafeteria to a company called Chartwells. Uh, they, the contract with Chartwells is ending uh, at the end of uh, July. July 1st. July, it ends July 1st. And uh, the new school is deciding not to rehire all of the workers who currently work with Chartwell. They're making them they're essentially firing them and making them reapply for their jobs. Uh, so we have decided to occupy the cafeteria and demand that every single worker uh, be rehired, that they don't have to reapply for their jobs. Uh, we want to save every single job. We want higher wages than they had before, and we want them to have the same benefits. Some of these workers have worked here for 16 years. They'll be losing their pensions, their health care, and their livelihood. Uh, some of these workers were, one third of the workers are over the age of 50. They were planning on retiring from these jobs. So this is really very serious. Uh, essentially, <clears throat> I belong to a group called Communist Student Group that called for the occupation uh, because we felt that the union was not providing adequate leadership. Uh, the union was acting purely retroactively. The union wanted to allow them to get fired and then help them reapply. Uh, on an individual basis. And so we initiated a collective struggle that was proactive, not retroactive. Uh, the union has been obstructive throughout this entire process. And this morning, uh, we received a joint statement between Unite Here Local 100, the cafeteria workers union, and the president of the school calling off the occupation, saying that they've reached a deal to extend the contract with Chartwells. Uh, the problem is, we have no reason to believe that after that contract ends in six months or a year, that the school won't try to do this exact same thing. Another problem is we called some workers and they had no idea that this was happening. Uh, the union has issued this joint statement with the school explicitly asking the occupiers to leave the cafeteria and allow service to resume as usual without consulting the workers who have been very clear with us that they do not want us to leave this cafeteria until they, uh, the contract has been signed by every single worker and all of them are on board with what's happening. So we feel that the union is truly just representing the interests of the boss, not of the workers, and we will continue this occupation until every single worker is in agreement that they want us to leave. <clears throat> 
I'm just, just to clarify, if workers choose to unite and to declare their power through a union, we will honor that declaration, just as the student employees at the new school have declared that we will unite under a union in order to win a fair contract. We will honor this request of the cafeteria workers as soon as we are assured that it is their choice that this declaration is good. Uh, we want these workers unionized. We, we have no problem with them. Uh, continuing this union contract, but what we think is important is for the workers to organize themselves outside of the legal framework of the trade union as an uh, autonomous uh, worker power. Thank you both. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, welcome everyone to a conversation with Yanis. Varoufakis, and, and particularly a discussion of his new book, Talking to My Daughter About the Economy, or How Capitalism Works and How It Fails. And it's a great pleasure for me to be sitting here with, with Giannis, who's really just an enormous uh, figure, both in the economics profession, in the political profession, in the finance profession. Uh, and uh, we're very lucky at the New School to to have him visit us. Um, he is an economist, and I have known him for decades as really a great economist, a mathematical economist, a game theorist, who published such great works, I noticed, as Econometric Methods on Minitab, a manual. <laughs> but he did write a book, Game Theory, A Critical Introduction, which is actually a classic in game theory. So Giannis just has a kind of remarkable span of accomplishments and skills, as all of you know. He is an academic and politician who served as the Greek Minister of Finance from January to July of 2015 when he resigned. He was a Syriza member of the Hellenic Parliament for Athens B from January to September 2015. He did his PhD at Essex in economics, where he also studied, uh, I'm sorry, uh, studied mathematics and began his career there. He then went on uh, following Thatcher's victory in 87. He moved to Australia out of the UK, where he taught at University, Sydney, University of Sydney for really a, a considerable amount of time and really established himself as a premier critical thinker on uh, microeconomics. He returned to Greece that year uh, to teach at University of Athens, and he currently still has an appointment at Athens. He was, uh, interestingly, economist in residence for Valve Corporation in Seattle uh, before moving to teach at the University of Texas, Austin. And of course, his publications go way beyond game theory and include you know, very important interventions into the Eurozone crisis debate, the Greek debt crisis problem, and now a series of books on capitalism, globalization, automation, and democracy, which I think will largely be our focus tonight. In January of 2015, he was appointed Minister of Finance and led the negotiations with Greece's creditors during the Greek government debt crisis. They failed to reach an agreement with creditors, leading to the 2015 bailout referendum. And the day following the referendum, on 6th of July 2015, Giannis resigned as Minister of Finance and was replaced by Euclid Sakalados. So on August 24th, Varoufakis voted against the third bailout package, and in ensuing September election, did not stand for re-election. He has since appeared in many debates, many lectures, many interviews. I was just hearing about uh, one you had with uh, Noam Chomsky. In February 2016, very importantly, he launched the Democracy in Europe Movement 2025 and subsequently backed a Remain vote in the UK's Parliamentary Union membership referendum in 2016. And I look forward very much to discussing his current activities in relation to EU politics and democratization of the, uh, of the Eurozone. So welcome, please give a warm welcome to Yanis Varoufakis. Thank you, Ruth. Yes. Thank you. So this is a very wide-ranging book, and of course, um, 
we're not restricted to talking about the book tonight because uh, uh, there's some pretty important issues uh, to debate both in this building and in the world today, which Giannis is very involved in. But I wanted to start just to hear where this came from, because it's a talking to my daughter book. And it is written, it's written in the second person, you, talking to his daughter. And I just wanted to, I, just to, to hear, before we forget about that motivation, mm -hmm. how you came up with that as the way to explain capitalism, talking to your young daughter. We economists have a tendency to say that which everybody understands in an inc incomprehensible language, uh, because the only one economic concept that we grasp is that of monopoly. So if we manage to monopolize economics, <laughs> uh, we get a very nice, tidy little profit for ourselves. So the only way to break this down, at least in my head, the only way of organizing my thoughts in a manner that would allow me to write in a way that would be comprehensible, I thought, was to try to address it to my 12-year-old uh, 12, 12 daughter and try to imagine that I'm trying to explain things to her um, in a manner that would not Im immediately elicit, stop it, Dad, you are becoming exceptionally boring yet again. <laughs> um, so it was a device so that I would organize my thoughts about what I think in the end really matters. Because the, 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 you know, the deeper motivation here is that there are no experts in economics. Economics is not a science. Uh, without a conviction that the average man, woman, even you know, old, older child, can grasp the basics of economics, democracy simply doesn't work. Because if we uh, defer to the experts, uh, and the experts are the mainstream of the economics profession, we might as well just pull down the shutters on democracy, which is effectively what has happened a very long time ago. Before we get to democracy and capitalism, thank you for that about your daughter. I want to also talk about the book and the writing of the book, because uh, I got to page 116, and, and I started writing notes about all the references to literature, to film, to Greek mythology, Faust, Goethe's Faust, Dickens' Hard Time, Steinbeck's Grapes, Grapes of Wrath, Rousseau, Shelley's Frankenstein, The Matrix, Blade Runner, Sophocles. And then I, on one page 116, I just want you to comment. Those who write well about the economy borrow their best ideas from artists, novelists, scientists. Can you make a comment? On... Well, from the very, very beginning, if you look at Adam Smith, Adam, Adam Smith's conceptualization is just a philosophical one, and even um, uh, a religious, literary, uh, secular version of a religious. Uh, so if you look at the, you know, the, 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 the great um, paradox in Smith's thinking that the best way to serve the public good, the public interest, is, is if no one tries to serve it. Yeah? <laughs> that's, that's pure Sophocles. That's pure Sophocles. And then you add to this the invisible hand, which is, of course, overstated in the neoliberal tradition. But the, 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 this is an, an allusion to a kind of providential process that happens behind the, the people's backs, uh, not because there is a God who is moving it. It's a secular providential process. Uh, the, the whole story about unintended consequences, which is uh, the stuff of Shakespeare as well as philosophy. So that's just, you know, yeah, beginning no, with Adam Smith. You go to Marx, okay, then, then you have the whole gamut of, uh, yes. g uh, you know, German and Greek drama, from Goethe to Euripides to, with a, you know, a bit of Epicurean philosophy, lots of doses of Hegel, um, and then everything, you know, then the concept of commodity, of capital accumulation, of schemas of reproduction, is a derivative of this kind of cultural milieu that Marx brings to economics. You want to speak about Keynes, same thing. Uh, it's only the, the libertarians who seem to be lacking in, uh, uh, in, in, in a cultural depth. <laughs> so let, let's jump to the present, and then we'll, we'll, come back. we'll come back to the big picture of debt and capitalism and, and automation. And if you could kind of give us, let's jump right into where you are today, where, where, how the Greek economy 
is faring under, under this, uh, this austerity regime, how, uh, how your efforts are going in terms of the Euro politics and kind of take, take us through where you've been in the last couple of years and where this movement that you're now engaged with really hopes to go. Okay, let's start with Greece. It will be a very short statement. Every day is worse than the previous one. Full oh. stop. <laughs> While at the same time, we have an insult that um, completes the injury with the uh, monstrous celebrations of the end of the crisis. Greek recovery, Greek success story and all that. Mm -hmm. They tried it in 2014, they're bringing it out. They're talking about the end of the bailout in August, which is, uh, it would be hilarious if it was not so tragic. Uh, the, the situation is really very simple. In 2010, uh, the Greek state went bankrupt as a result of the systemic Euro crisis. We were the first domino to fall. And since then we have fraudulent bankruptcy concealment by the institutions of Europe and the IMF. Mm -hmm. um, and the only way you can conceal a bankruptcy is by throwing new loans at the bankrupt, pretending that the old loans are being repaid by the new loans, and the new loans are provided uh, with uh, conditions uh, that shrink the income that was not enough to repay the old loans, and now the shrinking income will supposedly... A 10-year-old can tell you that this is not um, a, a rational process and it can't end well and it's not ending well and Greece is in the process of desertification as a result. Uh, we're losing something between 15 and 20,000 young people every month for a small country that is uh, mm -hmm. calamitous, especially, uh, if not criminal, especially in view of the fact that these are the best educated ones. So the whole country's investment into the young people uh, which is huge because you know, Greeks pay a very significant proportion of wealth of income um, to educate the young. Uh, and this investment is uh, scattered in the winds. So that, that, yeah. That, yeah. that's it. That's and, the and, and all the stories about improvement and uh, recovery and also they are just the insulting part of the injury. Um, but going back to the European scene, yeah. or actually moving from Greece to the European scene. What I keep insisting upon is that the fact that eight years after that crime against logic, the Greek bailout, yes. which I just described, the fact that the European Union is maintaining its denial and is continuing to impose exactly the same recipe upon the faltering Greek social economy, uh, can be only one of two things, either orchestrated misanthropy, uh, a conspiracy mm -hmm. against the Greeks, which I don't believe, right. or something else. And it's that something else, which is my theory, and I'm sticking to it. Um, Berlin and Paris have not decided what to do with the euro. Uh, the euro is unsustainable as it is. The European Union is... Uh, fragmenting as a result of the unsustainability of the single currency, which is now uh, the infrastructure of the whole European Union project, even countries that are not using the euro. Berlin and, uh, and Paris are engaged in a kind of um, relationship, let's call it, euphemistically, which, and I'm going to use the words, the very words Emmanuel Macron, the president of France, uh, um, related to me personally, when he was describing these meetings. That was be just before he became president. Mm -hmm. He said, every time I meet with my German colleagues, and remember, he is supposed to be the most pro-German of French politicians, the most pro-European uh, French politician. He's not Le, Le Pen, and he's certainly not Mélenchon, right? Right. Uh, he's a avid neoliberal, or not so much neoliberal, uh, some kind of Scandinavian, mm. Social Democrat misplaced by 15 years, so he sounds neoliberal. <laughs> anyway, he, um, he said to me, every time I speak to my, to my German colleagues, the 100-year war comes to mind between Calvinists and Catholics mm. because it's exactly the same conflict of the deaf. So th that is the, my explanation about the fact that they are allowing Greece to continue like this, uh, is that they're not going to solve the Greek problem if they have not worked out a modus vivendi, 
that, is, that makes the Eurozone sustainable. France is not sustainable within the Euro, the way the Euro is structured. Macron knows that. He has confessed this to me. Uh, he would actually tell you as well if you, if you ever happen to be in the what same you, room. Can you elaborate on that? Just I don't quite get it. Well, it's really very simple. You have France and you have Germany. They're fused by means of the same currency, so there's no possibility of devaluation. Right. Uh, and you have a, a, a Germany that has almost twice the concentration ratio of, uh, of France. Uh, it, it, it has an excess capacity which is much greater than the excess capacity of France. In other words, price cost margins that are much greater than the ones that, on average, French industry has, especially if you take into the fact that a, lot, a large section of the uh, French economy is still agrarian uh, compared to the German. Mm -hmm. So when you, you know, when you have a, a, t such differing degrees of oligopoly power in two countries that are fused together, it is natural that since you don't have the capacity of the French currency to slide, that what's going to happen is that France will need increasing doses of austerity in order to be maintained within this stranglehold of the common currency with Germany. Uh, and the result of this is discontent. The result of this is that the political center in France is completely and totally gone. And uh, you have whole uh, regions of the country right. that are totally anti-European as a result of this uh, structural slide into greater, in, 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 into effectively a deflationary dynamic that it is also localized it's class-based and geography-based in, 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 in France. So um, while the, you know, so read the newspapers, the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, they celebrated the election of Macron. And understandably, because if Le Pen had won, of course right. you, you, don't, you wouldn't want to live in France. And also the European Union would have gone uh, Merkel would have been fired the next day by her own party mm. because she would have been accused of having lost France. Mm. Um, so he saved Merkel. Yeah? And what does Merkel do? What does she do? She stings him like a bee or bites him like a snake. Because remember, he got elected, he, did, he gave that Sorbonne speech, very moderate uh, Eurozone reform proposals, a small common budget, which would be macroeconomically insignificant, but his view is, you know, you right. put your foot in the door and then later on you open the door. That kind of gradualism, which is, for me, it's too little, too late. But nevertheless, that's him, right? Mm -hmm. um, a, a little bit of a common unemployment insurance, um, turning the, uh, the, the, the illusion of a banking union into something more of a banking union mm -hmm. by having common deposit insurance. Basic things, things that everybody knows are absolutely essential. So he puts them out there. What happens? They go shot down. Today, those proposals have been utterly, been, they've been blown out of the water by Merkel. Yeah? Not because Merkel doesn't give a damn about what happens to all these things, but she is a player. She recognizes what the balance of power is within her own party. She realizes that her own party would not like to say yes to Macron, so she shoots them down one by one by one. So, going back to Greece, while France and Germany are locked in this uh, dysfunctional relationship whereby the political dialogue is not leading to reforms of the common currency that would make France sustainable within Germany, within Germany, uh, within the <laughs> Eurozone. Well, that was a slip of the tongue, wasn't it? Um, they're not going to bother with Greece. All they're asking of Greek governments or making Greek governments do it, go to the corner there, lie down and die quietly. And, you know, unfortunately, Greek prime ministers, including my com comrade and colleague, are doing it. Uh, the so, lure of having the prime ministerial limousine must be very great. Listen, at risk of getting <laughs> too far in the weeds here, t tell us about Germany. And, and you, you hint at Merkel biting Macron, and obviously she's being pushed politically in the coalition formation, et cetera, very vulnerable politically. But they're still running their big surplus. They're still yeah. kind of earning the, all the benefits that you've attacked them for for a decade without showing uh, the kind of uh, political will towards Greece, for example, that, you know, that, that you've been talking about for years. 
So how, how, how has that sustained itself, that he, he, hegemony? Well, there is no such thing as Germany. There is a variety of Germanys. Let us not forget that the bottom 50% of the population are far worse off now than they were 15 years ago. And the bottom 35% are in a desperate situation compared to where they were 15 years ago. The so-called reforms, the hard sphere reforms right. of the 1990s have bitten um, uh, very, very strongly, and uh, that bottom 35% now is in a, in, in a state of um, uh, upheaval. The hatred that you have of the establishment, including the establishment in Brussels. I, I go to Germany often because our movement, has, uh, I'm very proud of that. Most of the, num the largest percentage of members of our movement are German. Really? Yep. This, the, you know, this is... We are trying to, to, to prove that another Europe is not just possible, but it's here. At least in, so in, let's in, jump to in our own movement. Tell us about your movement. But let me just yeah. answer the question okay. about, about Germany, because uh, Germany today, when I visit, reminds me of Britain 15 years ago. The creeping Euroscepticism and the European sentiment, which was in Britain coming from two opposite sides of the political economic spectrum. You would have it from the discarded working class, mm -hmm. who didn't give a damn about the European Union, they just hated anything that the establishment in London liked, including the European Union. And parts of the ruling class, which were not happy to share power over the riffraff in their own country with Brussels. Right. That, that was the situation 10, 15 years mm -hmm. ago in Britain. And in the end, this embrace um, was completed in 2016 with the Brexit referendum. Uh, and Greece had something to do with it. Because the way that our government was crushed by uh, the, the European Union uh, brought many good British people onto the side of Brexit. They were saying to me, I was campaigning in Britain against Brexit, and they were saying to me, look, we like you, but we're not going to do as you're saying. We're going to vote for Brexit, because um, if we vote for Remain, it, it will be another tour in the same story we now have is going to be celebrating 10 Downing Street. We don't like that. And secondly, uh, the way that you were being treated by the EU, uh, this act of mm. di di dictatorial incompetence, mm -hmm. uh, it does not um, warm us to it. So that is the spirit that now I see in Germany as well. Huh? From a macroeconomic point of view, if you think of, of the fact that in Germany now you have this a unique phenomenon in capitalist history. And maybe I'm mean, here in New School, there are better economic historians than I am. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe it has happened before, but I am not familiar with any such uh, situation where you've got a government in surplus, budget surplus, corporations sitting on a huge pile of cash doing nothing, so they, they're in surplus, and families that are in surplus. So everybody's in surplus. <laughs> Uh, well, there have to be deficits somewhere, yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> so they, ha they have to export them. Now, the, the, this new social democratic um, minister of finance who replaced uh, my good friend Wolfgang Schäuble <laughs> confirmed what I had written in this book that I very much fear that the social democratic party would be far worse than the Christian democratic party, and they are. He's pushing the surplus further up than Schäuble. Schäuble was more of a Keynesian than this, than this social democrat. Okay, so uh, well, when you're doing this in a Eurozone where effectively your surpluses become deflationary forces for the deficit region right. of the Eurozone, and you've got an internal devaluation process in the rest of the Eurozone, right. which on the one hand, of course, is squeezing prices and wages down, but because of oligopolistic uh, tendencies, prices are not squashed as far down as wages. So you have a diminution of aggregate demand from the monopolistic or oligopolistic structure of the deficit in the economies. And at the same time, you have debts that, of course, are not divided, private and, and public debts that are not divided. Uh, then you end up with a central bank, Mario Draghi, having to continue doing QE in order to to keep Italy and Spain in, in the Eurozone. QE, which is keeping interest rates below zero, when in Germany, uh, that is destroying the banking system, the, the smaller banks, where mm -hmm. most people have their, uh, their savings, and in particular, the pension funds. So you end up having the middle class 
seeing their egg nest shrink, while their children find it difficult to find jobs that are good quality as opposed to mini jobs. And that simply feeds into racism, it feeds into the alternative for Deutschland, and this is why Merkel has effectively lost control of her own party. And the two parties together, the two ordo liberal parties, yeah. which is the Christian Democrats and now the Social Democrats, together, the, from having 84% of the vote, now they have 51% of the vote. And if they, there was an election today, they would go even below that. So Germany is in deep crisis as a result. So this, it's, it's not Greece versus Germany. This is a class war against the weaker members of German society and the weaker members of Greek society. Uh, you have uh, effectively uh, an abandonment of any attempt to manage the macroeconomy of the Eurozone by anyone. So, so we tell are us in about, a, we, so, we are in a kind of great deflation. Yeah. So tell us about the movement. I mean, so, and, and how, what do you do when you're faced, in, when you're faced when you're faced with a situation like this? There are only two things you can do. Either adopt a disintegrationist stance. Let's, right. uh, this European right. Union is not working, let's do away with it. Uh, or you create, you, you go the, exactly in the opposite di direction, creating a pan-European movement, a progressive pan-European movement, the purpose of which is to uh, arrest this slide into a postmodern 1930s at the pan-European <laughs> level. Uh, I have to say that there is a, a big clash now amongst progressives and especially in the left in Europe between those two schools of thought. So these, school, two, these two schools of thought yeah. exist both in the right, on the right and on the left. And there are forces on the progressive side of politics that are saying this EU project was always a neoliberal uh, project yeah. and it needs to be dissolved. Now, I find myself, I'll speak personally now, yeah. in a difficult position because I campaigned as a young man against Greece's entry into the EU, the European Common Market, as it was called, for, I believe, very good reasons, like mm -hmm. Jeremy Corbyn. Jeremy Corbyn, Tony Benn, right. in 1975, campaigned against Britain's entry right. into the European Economic Community. Uh, I campaigned against Greece getting into the Euro in the late 1990s. As a Greek economic professor, I was considered to be eccentric, not to recognize the beauty, the glory, and the stealth of the Eurozone. Um, but would we that must have be careful, saved Greece? Because by the once way? you're in, not joining in 90, would 90 would that have saved Greece over the Absolutely. long term? Not joining in '98. Absolutely. If Greece had not joined in 1998, 99, 2000, what would have happened is, between 2000 and 2008, we would have had tepid growth, simply because we would not have the capital influx that we had because of the Eurozone. Uh, so Greece would be just as corrupt and inefficient as always, huh? but it would be growing a little bit. And then in 2008, we would have a currency devaluation. We would have yeah, a year, 18 months, of something like a Bulgaria level <laughs> of recession, small. Okay. We would continue to be corrupt and problematic. The sun would be sh shining. We would be singing and dancing on the beach. It would be the same thing. But you do not, we would not have a humanitarian crisis. And you know, that really matters because all that matters in the end is humans. So yeah, absolutely. But this is where my, the, the, our roads part between yeah. you know, the, the disintegrationists and us. Right. It is one to say, thing to say we should not have entered. And it's quite another thing to say we should leave. Because if you leave, you don't necessarily end up uh, where you would have been had you not entered. It's the difference between statics and dynamics. Uh, so I was never a supporter of Grexit, even though I was preparing for it because it was better than what we have now, which is you know, dead bondage forever and desertification and losing uh, you know, labor and capital uh, to the rest of the world. So uh, effectively now on the left in progressive politics in, 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 in Europe, there are two main forces, the disintegrationists, and I shall mention some, name, some names in case you know something about European politics. So you, you have Jean-Luc Mélenchon, who was the presidential candidate uh, supported by the left or part of the left last year against Macron and Le Pen and the rest. You have half of the left party of Germany, of Die Linke. They're ho ho hopelessly divided 
between the Oscar and Sarah group and the Katya group on the other. Um, half of them want our disintegrationists, the other half are with us. Uh -huh. uh, you have a very strange situation in Spain where Podemos have a very considered policy on Europe, not to have a policy on Europe. <laughs> but they've gone into bed with Melenchon recently. Uh, and then you have us, DiEM25. We, uh, in the last few months, we announced, we actually are going to create a political party that runs in the elections in May 2019, the European Parliament elections across Europe. We have a name, actually, that we, did, that we, we came up with two weeks ago in Lisbon. We're going to be, gone, we are going to be called the European Spring. I'm very, very proud of this name. I like it very much. Uh, and, you know, we have created different parties because, you know, we, we need to simulate a pan-European election. Because, you know, when it comes to the European Union, um, my answer when people ask me what do I think about it is the same one as that which Mahatma Gandhi gave when he was asked about British civilization. He said it would be a good idea. <laughs> so there is no such thing as a European Union. You have to register national parties and run separately. So we're doing that. We now have a Greek party. It's called Mera 25, which is the Mera in Greek means day, as in Diem, Diem 25. Mm -hmm. uh, in France, we're going to run together with uh, Benoit Hamon, who was the Socialist Party candidate. Mm -hmm. He has a new movement called the Generation, hopefully with the French Communist Party. Uh, we are in negotiations with part of the Greens, in uh, Italy, we are forming a new party headed by the mayor of Napoli, Luigi de Magistris. Uh, in Portugal, uh, we have a, a party called Livre, which means freedom, I believe, um, headed by Rui Tavares. We have the Danish party, The Alternative, which is the third largest party in Denmark. They are a fantastic, totally, totally mad, wonderful bunch of people. Um, and, well, and we are also very, very pleased that we have a small feminist progressive party in Poland, of all places, called Razem. No country needs a feminist progressive party as much as Poland does these days. And we're very, very chuffed to have them in our midst. And we are now gathering other parties as well. It's building up um, a party it's, in Slovenia, it's very exciting. in I mean, What's amazing about the EU is crisis, huge Great Recession, Greek crisis, existential crisis, yeah. and the democratization has, has not really gone forward other than, than this kind of movement. I mean, it just hasn't right. happened but in like the way that one might have predicted. Well, so does it's, this remind you of anything? Do you remember the 1930s? <laughs> yes. Had crisis, fragmentation, and democratization didn't do very well. <laughs> yeah. So well, that's, that's a scary thing. We, you know, we, we better do better than they did. I wanted to, I want to talk about capitalism, and I want to talk uh, in this context of uh, uh, you were talking about wage austerity in particular, and in the book you have a brilliant discussion of political money. So I want to talk about wages and money, and I, uh, you know, obviously uh, we're seeing the same. We're, we're down to 3.9 percent unemployment mm -hmm. in the U.S. with continued wage stagnation, mm -hmm. right? And so somehow we're not seeing wage movement even with relatively robust growth here. And so obviously in Greece and the rest of Europe, you're, you're seeing lower growth and uh, higher unemployment and I imagine the same kind of wage stagnation. So kind of I, I, I wanted to ask you about wage austerity as a norm within, within capitalism and how you see, particularly from the Greek perspective, how that the function that 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 play is. And then we'll talk, to talk about money after that. Well, if you need any argument that um, the standard neoclassical, neoliberal argument uh, that a reduction in wages increases competitiveness and rebalances the current account surplus, or the current account, right. in a way that replaces uh, aggregate demand uh, that comes from wages with aggregate demand that comes from exports. Well, Greece is a very good example to debunk this rubbish. <laughs> huh? Because Greece is the wet dream of every libertarian that was ever born. <laughs> the wet dream. Think about it. 40% eh? reduction in wages. 48% reduction in uh, 
pensions, in state pensions. You can't, you can't make up these numbers, right? Amazing. Uh, wait for it. Uh, of all the unemployed, and we have a lot of them in Greece, do you know what percentage has ever received one euro? One, just one euro of unemployment benefit? Come on, someone. How, what percentage of the Greek unemployed have received a single euro of unemployment benefit ever? Nine. Nine percent. Yeah? Libertarian wet dream. Yeah? Uh, uh, something else that I think every libertarian I, I know would go crazy over, we've banned trade unions. Banned trade unions? Well, I mean, they are allowed to exist, but uh, are, there's no collective bargaining. Yeah? So there are no collective bargaining processes or agreements. End. Finished. Finito. 40% um, reduction in the minimum wage. Effectively, there is no minimum wage. As we speak now, uh, the latest uh, figures I saw from the Bureau of Greek Labor Statistics uh, show that um, in a country which is not cheap, by the way, you, know, you would find that in, it's more expensive than many parts of the United States. Uh, and not in purchasing power parity, uh, in actual exchange rates. Uh, one third of those who work, work for $384 a month gross before tax. Got it? Before tax. Yeah, one third. $384. Mm. And what happens is, of course, they register as being part-time, but they're forced to work all hours. So effectively, we have the same kind of labor protection that Bangladesh has in the middle of Europe. And we went from a situation where there was protection. Now, you would have imagined, if you're a neoliberal, if you're a neoliberal, you don't give a damn. You say, okay, that's very good, because this is, Greece deserved it. These people were um, lazy, and they were profligate, and they deserve what they got. Fine. Let's not get into this argument. But the question I would put to them is, yeah, but wouldn't you expect after that magnificent internal devaluation and complete uh, abandonment of any protection for workers and so on, the, we, you know, we have a f the most flexible labor market there is. I mean, the next step is slavery. <laughs> yeah? um, wouldn't you expect exports to increase? Some kind of rebound? Nothing. Nothing. It's... <laughs> Statistically insignificant increases in exports. Why? Well, the reason, of course, is because the whole place has gone to the dogs and you have even profitable companies. I, I know a business person in uh, Volos, Thessalia, who inherited a factory from his parents and so on. And it was a factory that made plastic containers uh, for export. And it was always profitable, even during the worst of the crisis. 95, 96% of output went overseas. So he should not have been affected by the low aggregate demand internally. Right. Huh? Wages down, uh -huh. all, everything down, all the costs down. And he called me the other day, he said that uh, he's going bankrupt. I said, How come? He said, well, because you know, I'm getting all the imports from abroad and my suppliers do not accept Greek bank uh, letters of credit. So the bankruptcy of the Greek banking system kills off even our um, exporters, you know, the, the, the most efficient of exporters. So uh, wage austerity and flexibility of labor markets uh, is, is, a, is a theory that is, is purely used for propaganda purposes in order to cover up either for failures of macroeconomic um, policy making, or for what is outright class war. And the reversal would work? What's the, now we're in 2018, not 15. Mm -hmm. What's the Varoufakis plan on the other side of that? Well, for Greece or generally? For Greece. Generally, the problem that we have in, 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 at, at the global level even if you take yeah. China into consideration, at the global capitalist level, we have a major incongruity between savings and investment. The, the, the disparity between aggregate savings and aggregate investment in non-financial goods, I mean investment, actual investment, not paper money investment. Right. Uh, that incongruity that has never been as great as it is now, ever, since perhaps 1930. Uh, and it's, therefore, it's not a great 
wonder that you have a general stagnation as we speak. Even Larry Summers understands this. <laughs> um, you know, you, you have here in the, in the United States, you have a massive boost through um, unethical tax cuts. You yeah. have a massive boost through years of yeah. uh, unconventional monetary policies. Uh, you have you know, 10 trillion that has been created of wealth. So every single lever has been pulled that you would have expected from you know, a kind of supply side perspective to have created growth of seven, eight percent, and you don't, you have much more debit growth. And especially if you look at growth in industries that actually create good quality jobs, there isn't any, even in the United States. In uh, Europe, you have negative interest rates still to this day. You have QE that keeps pumping money into the system. But all that that does, it, it makes the, the imbalance between savings and investment grow further only because the, 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 the money that is being produced, generated by the system in order to supposedly to rebalance uh, an austerity-prone world, uh, is being used in order to, to, to buy back shares. Right. And that creates greater inequality. It does not create more investment. So the, the, the whole thing perpetuates. So look, but you what's me, brilliant, what, what no, we do? no, what's brilliant about this book, I have to tell you, it is deep in Marxist analysis, Polanyi is very prominent, Minsky, in terms of debt, endogenous debt cycles, Keynes, as you've just elaborated, and those words are almost never uttered. It's so beautifully told. And the question is... Uh, I made the point of not mentioning any economist or any ism or any theory. It, I mean, it's, be it's beautiful in that respect, that you tell these stories so compellingly without without invoking the, the old theoretical canon. And I just wonder, what's wrong with capitalism, that S minus I is so great? Say that uh, capitalism is doing so wonderfully, interest rates are so low, and all the things you mentioned, and the investment is not taking place. Mm. What's wrong with capitalism? It's an, it's an irrational system. So elaborate. Well, I don't need to, to explain this in the new school, for God's sakes. Do I? <laughs> Have we reached the stage? <laughs> Look, Marx's critique of capitalism was that capitalism is not, the problem with capitalism is not that it is unjust. Uh, Marx had no time for the concept of justice, for the concept of equality. Remember what he said did, he did to poor citizen Western? Uh, Say it, it again. Remember what he, he did, how he, he just destroyed citizen Western yes. in, in the beginning of wages, prices, and profit, the, the little pamphlet. Uh, his critique was that it is an irrational system that it makes really bad use of the technologies that it creates, that at the same time that as it is producing immense wealth, it must produce gigantic and unprecedented forms of depravity, deprivation, and poverty. The two, this is not an accident, it's part of the system, that the crises are an essential regulating device, so having you know, the grapes of wrath periodically is the only way that the system can sustain itself, in other words, it's a system which yeah. is designed to take whole generations and put them in the dustbin. Uh, and this is where I learned at the age of 12 or 13, my economics. Um, just, yeah. 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 And I have to say that I was indelibly marked by that view. That's so, how you got into game theory. Um, no, no, game theory came much later by a complete historical accident. I came across a paper in uh, the American Economic Review by some MIT professor, and I was so incensed by it that I dedicated a large chunk of my life trying to bring it down, or okay. to explain to myself why I was incensed with it. But that's another story. So the <laughs> irrationality of capitalism. I, you know, we, I want to open it up for question, questions for Giannis. I had, I wanted, but two, count, two other questions I had first. First of all, about debt and political money, yeah. which is also very brilliantly rendered in the book. Simply, I had the but, Irish finance minister, a right winger who hated my guts. He actually said so in the review that he hated my guts. But at the same time, he actually said that this chapter is the best chapter I've ever read on money. So explain, explain wow. to us what you mean. Huh? Explain to us what it means. Political money is, is a phrase I wasn't familiar with. So I'm, I was really intrigued. Well, I made it up in response to Bitcoin and to, you know, to, to the gold standard. And 
generally to the quantity theory of money. Uh, the, you know, the Bitcoiners, in their interesting attempt to um, make a break, to escape the politicization of money through you know, the, the central banks, have created this uh, uh, myth that you can yes. leave it to an algorithm uh, which effectively simulates the gold standard, but it does so in a way that does not put the government Right. At the commanding heights right. of the central Self -regulated. bank. Self-regulated. Uh, so th th yeah, this is the fantasy of polit a, a political money. You can have money that serves all of us, that it is not a subject of democracy, it's not a subject of collective decision making. It's a technological solution, uh, which... Um, um, but it's also political money that has gotten us into such difficulty. That is correct. But politics is like all instruments of humanity. They can be used for good or for ill. So how do you do democracy? But the democ point I'm making is that you cannot depoliticize money. Even an attempt to depoliticize money, which is what the ECB did, the European Central Bank. The whole point about setting up the European Central Bank in Europe, going back to the original discussion about Europe, think about what we did in Europe. We did something quite remarkable. Uh, never has it been done before, and I hope that it will never be done again. Uh, we created a central bank without a state, uh, and we right. have 19 states without a central bank. Uh, the right. whole point oh, being that, you know, point. you just, like Bitcoin, you, instead of having an algorithm, you have uh, a building in Frankfurt. They have it like, something, something like, like an algorithm working in there, producing a quantity of money that politicians cannot meddle with, therefore parliaments cannot meddle with, therefore it's outside the realm of democratic politics, or politics at all. And then, of course, um, when you do that, privateers, private banking cre creates as much money as they want during the good times, and during the bad times, it all disappears, right. and you have a massive recession. Uh, and then they have to ha create all those shenanigans that Mario Draghi had to go through in order to justify QE as if it is not QE. Uh, so they understood that money must be political in the sense that yeah. the quantity of money yeah. and the type of money must constantly be adjusted and the adjustments that you make will always have political and class determined and related effects. In other words, it, can, it must be politicized and it better be democratized if it is going to be political. So on the democratized money point, just to come back to your, your movement, your European movement, is democratization of central bank and money a central piece of the platform? Yes, you didn't it is. really elaborate. Yes, it is, but we're b being very careful. You see, Europeans are smart people. Uh, all people are smart people, but now I'm talking about Europe. So, <laughs> I sound very Eurocentric for a moment. Uh, <laughs> didn't mean to, sorry. Okay, let me start again. Uh, <laughs> every, every time a European voter, however exasperated she or he may be with the developments in Europe. Here's a politician say, elect me and I will change the charter of the European Central Bank. I will, I will bring on a new treaty. I will change the constitutional setting and institutional setting of Europe. And then everything will be fantastic. We're all going to be tall, blonde, blue-eyed and Swedish. Yeah? <laughs> Joking. They panic because they know that for the charter of the ECB to change, you need 19 parliaments to agree. And in some cases, not parliaments, but referenda. So that will never, ever mm. happen in the mind of the electorate. So, of course, we should change the charter of the ECB. It was written by cretins who wanted to be particularly sad sadistic towards a whole <laughs> continent. But if, if this is your political program, if people, you know, if journalists, and you know how journalists are, they shove a microphone in your, in your mouth and say, okay, why should we vote for you? It's a, the, the correct question. Mm -hmm. If you say, ah, oh, because we are going to change the chart of the ECB, that's it. The public has immediately switched off you. They think, okay, go away. This will never happen. You're wasting our time. So what we are trying to do uh, as DiEM25, what, no, actually what we have done, over, we spent two years, and I'm, I'm personally very proud of this because it's actually quite good work. We created a document which we call the European New Deal, and I think by the name you understand what it is. It is an attempt to reconfigure existing institutions within the existing rules mm -hmm. in a manner that would make an appreciable difference when it comes to the four sub-crises afflicting Europe. Uh, public debt, private debt, banking, 
low levels of investment, especially in the things that we need, like green transition and poverty. Yeah? Now, we think that it is absolutely perfectly possible within the existing charter of the ECB, with the European stability mechanism, that awful institution as it is, uh, using the only good institution that we have in Europe, in Europe that we should be proud of, the European Investment Bank, and its offshoot, the European Investment Fund. So we, 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 we set up a kind of new deal along the lines of Roosevelt's new deal for today, using the existing institutions in order to effectively press into the service of uh, the things that need to be done in Europe today, there are around 2 trillion euros, which is idling around, doing nothing, gathering dust and beating up asset prices in Europe without contributing to investment. And that can happen tomorrow morning, and it can happen on the basis of a single press conference, where you have the president of the European Investment Bank, the president mm -hmm. of the European Central Bank, the president of the European Union Council, the president of the European Stability Mechanism, making one announcement that takes half an hour, and suddenly the environment is complete. Of course, you need political will to do it. We need to win elections in order to make them, right. these people do it. But you don't need new rules. You don't need new treaties. Gotcha. So, in a sense, two steps. First step, stabilize. New deal. Yeah? Not something extremely radical, but something that yeah. in the end is radical. Yeah. Uh, not because, of the, 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 because you blow anything up and you change the institutions, but because you do radical things with the existing boring institutions. And then, or simultaneously, embark upon what we call a constitutional assembly process, leading to within, and that's why DiEM25 has this 25 at the end, by the year 2025 to a constitutional assembly at the pan-European level to discuss what kind of co democratic constitution we want as Europeans for Europe. Because this is one thing we lack in you. You know, people say to me, oh, the Americans are together because they have the same language, because they are a homogeneous nation. That's not true. This country is not homogeneous at all. Uh, but what plays a very important role at the level of the imaginary in this country is the Constitution of the United States. Mm -hmm. Would it not be great if we, even if we didn't get to having a democratic constitution of the European Union, to have a constitutional assembly process where we actually discuss what it might be? Uh, can you, we imagine uh, no. 20 pages of a constitution of Europe that would actually work? Yeah. This is an exercise that would bring us together, and if the economic background has been stabilized through the New Deal process, the European Green New Deal, gotcha. said, uh, then this, uh, I can think of nothing else, no other process Listen, that I would bring ask, hope. I want to ask you my last question about kind of the, the uphill battle you fight, because what we, what we see and read a lot about is the illiberal turn and the turn away from the kind of democratic politics that you're describing, partly in response to the same issues that you're identifying, uh, stagnation, uh, fear, et cetera. And I just wonder uh, how your pro-Europe democratic agenda kind of confronts that, that right-wing illiberal move, you know, Orban, et cetera, um, that, that, you know, could potentially feed into your movement. Because these are people who are also disgruntled by the lack of European democracy. Yes, I mean, look, the 1930s is and we have our a similar, source. And we have a similar problem here in the US. The 1930s should be our point of reference. Because, uh, think about it, there was a spectacular failure of the establishment, whether it was the Weimar Republic or France at the time, or Holland for that matter, the sticking, sticking to, the, to, yeah. to, the, to the gold uh, standard until the last very, the last, the, you know, 1937. Um, and what did that bear? Nazism, fascism, uh, racism galore. And uh, uh, so the, 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 our failure to create a new deal for Europe uh, is simply going to become the greatest gift to the xenophobes and the racists that once again are showing a remarkable capacity to divide, multiply, <laughs> grow, and in the end unite amongst themselves. Look at the solidarity between all those uh, misanthropes, Salvini, the AfD, Le Pen. Yeah. Uh, they all love each other and they have no, the only people who actually show Serious internationalism in Europe today are the bankers and the fascists. We of the left have our work cut out for us, and we better, you know, shape up. Thank you, Giannis. I want to open it up. Why don't we give a hand?
So this is a guy I could talk to for three hours, but I should cede the floor to people here who also may have questions. We have, I was gonna ask people to, uh, to write their questions on index cards, speak. but I think we should just open yes. it up. Yeah, it's too complicated. So I can see most of you with your hands up, but I'll start just calling on you. If you could keep your comments to a minute maximum so that Giannis can, can comment, uh, it will allow everyone to speak, okay? Go ahead. Can people in the back here, we, we don't have microphone assistance because we didn't think we were going to use them. Well, that would be a very Go quick ahead. one to answer. Repeat very quickly and then please give a... Okay, on uh, and we modern have... monetary theory, if you, my book is written along that, those lines, more or less. You mentioned Jamie Galbraith. He's not only a great friend, uh, but he's also one of the authors of the European New Deal of, the, of, of DiEM25. So, you know, you're talking to the same gang. Um, job guarantee, it's also part of our program for Europe. And we estimate that in the end it's going to be cheaper than the welfare system that we now have in Europe, which is um, so inefficient in the sense that, especially in places like Britain, where something like 35% of the cost of the welfare state is um, aimed at humiliating the applicants. If you if you've seen I, uh, uh, what Ken Loach's movie, I forgot the title. Uh, I Daniel, what the, I keep saying Daniel Day Lewis, but it's not true. Anyway, um, so the, 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 what is a job guarantee system? Effectively, you are allowing people to stay in their communities hmm, and do things that they already do, but support them to do them. Things that the communities require, so that there is no internal migration or external migration. So if you look at the externalities, the positive externalities mm. that will come out of it, and you take away the, humi the, 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 you know, the whole me mechanics of humiliation, you have a much more efficient problem. Where I would disagree with some others, but you haven't mentioned that, is with the universal basic income. We are proposing what we call a, uh, a, univer a universal basic dividend, which is the same idea of d dividing amongst everyone a certain amount of money, but not money raised through taxation money that, that, that comes through dividends that accumulate in an equity fund, a public equity fund, where corporations are forced to deposit a, a significant percentage of their shares, especially after IPOs and, um, uh, oh. and reissues. Let, let's take a few comments in a row. Please, in the back. Can you shout a bit more? You have to shout, I'm sorry. Deaf in my old age. Yeah. Okay. Yep. In your book, if I'm not mistaken, you say that economics is not a science, which I agree completely with. Uh, the first question uh, related to this is, how come so many people think otherwise? And the second question is, since um, it's not scientific, how can anybody have convictions that their way is right? <laughs> wow. Have you ever heard of something called religion? <laughs> How can people be con so convinced that they are right that they kill other people? Yeah? Um, and why do people believe that? Say, well, look, we, we would all love for economics to be a science. I would want economics to be a science. Wouldn't it be splendid if it was like physics? And was, if we had a, a proper lab where we could rerun the great depression to see if we did things differently in 1929, 1930, what would come out, that would be fantastic, except that it is not possible. Yeah. <laughs> Keep going. Yes. Uh, oh, let me just add one more vignette yeah. to why it's not possible. Right. It's not possible for a very simple reason. Anybody who studied philosophy understands that. 
because nature is very different as a species to society. When it comes to natural science, uh, we are blessed with uh, a splendid independence between the phenomenon and our theories about the phenomenon. Uh, the phenomenon doesn't give a damn about our theories about it. So a meteorologist does not have to worry that if she predicts wrongly that there's going to be a twister you know, in Union Square tomorrow, that there might be one, um, just because she predicted it. Yeah? But in economics, the oh. phenomenon and the theory are one. Our theory of the world, of the society motivates us to create the society the way we create it. So our theory of society is part of that which we are trying to explain. This infinite regress, as Hegel would say, makes it impossible for economics to be a science. Full stop. Please. Hi. Uh, yeah, I, I came here uh, just to ask you one question, if I could. Uh, do you have any predictions about what is going to happen in this country over the next eight years? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me, let me upset you. I think Trump is going to be re-elected. You know why? Uh, wow. Because of the state of the Democratic Party. Every time I hear them, uh, you know, tell, dem demonize those who voted for Trump and explain Trump's victory on the basis of Facebook, Cambridge Analytica, and Putin, I think these people are determined not to win another election ever again. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's the applause line. Katrina, yes. Well, look. I think Stephanie and the rest here, and my colleagues who live in this country, are better suited to answer this question. The, just a couple of, of, of comments on the uh, American situation. We have, it is clear to me that we have an um, equity to earnings ratio which is worse than it was in 2006-07. We have private debt that is uh, ballooning at a time when you have very tepid growth and a world economy which simply cannot be sustained the way it is. The Chinese credit bubble is being deflated very smartly by the Chinese, but I don't know to what extent they can continue to do that. Europe is a cesspool of deflationary forces that it exports to the rest of the world. And in the middle of that, those tax cuts that Trump pushed through that are not only ethically appalling, uh, but at the same time boost the deficit, the budget deficit, in a way that does not have a substantial multiplier accelerator effect, while at the same time antagonizing those who will, will actually buy the treasuries to support it. Okay, put all this together, not looking good. So, if you get a recession, a Minsky recession, yeah. how does Trump get reelected? That well, was, I think that you'll you don't probably have get it after he gets reelected. I see, it comes after. <laughs> Go ahead. I used to think Minsky was a vaudeville owner. No, he was. <laughs> he was. Um, European Spring. Yes. It's a beautiful term. Tell us a little bit, though, about how it's going to be organized. Ah. We talked about the Polish family. I'm very Italy, pleased Italy, that you asked this. And, and is there a plank? Will it be the new Green Deal? And within that plank, uh, is there a plan? A plank. Is there a plank, a platform, oh. issues on which all European Spring candidates will run on? Or yeah, would it yeah. be different from... Oh, no, 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 no. no. Is there a war and peace plank? Is there a foreign policy? Okay, so first, how is the European Sp Spring governed, structured? Secondly, about our common agenda. To what extent is it common? And third, thirdly, the question of war and peace and how do we address it? Okay. Uh, I'm very glad you asked me this question because we are very excited by this. We're doing something that has never been done before. So, what we have agreed to do is uh, create a single governing council of European Spring where every single movement from across Europe that is represented has one representative uh, and everybody has an equal vote. And we have a sub-council with effectively our technicians who do all the the nitty-gritty before the council meetings. The, uh, this council is a provisional one. It's going to be elected in June 2019. Now, immediately after the May 2019 elections, we're going to have an election for it. And we're, but we are very excited about this election or the appointment. Uh, they, are, they are going to be elected by all the members of all our organizations as one constituency across Europe, number one. 
Number two, 25% of the seats will be selected by sortition amongst all our members. Lottery, like jury systems. Yeah? Uh, and uh, the, the, that will be the, you know, the official decision-making body. Regarding our agenda, already we're working towards presenting our agenda, in our manifesto, uh, the European New Deal, the, the, our policies on women, our policies on refugees, on migration, on issues of uh, what we call Europe's place in the world. Not, uh, we can't stand the word defense, offense, foreign, you know. We're all foreigners anyway. So we don't believe in foreign policy. Europe's place in the world. Uh, so it, it, it is an experiment that has never been tried before at this level of transnationality. Um, to give you another example, within DiEM25, the movement that brought this all together, uh, we, when, when we decide what the agenda, the economic policy will be for Greece, of our Greek party, everybody votes. That agenda that passed in, on 26th March, March oh. for our, our Greek economic policy agenda was voted by the Germans, by the Poles, by everyone. And everybody is going to vote on, Germany's, uh, on our policies in Germany and so on. So this is what, what I meant before when I said that another Europe is here. We are already trying to demonstrate by example, that it is here. And now I come to the last point, war and peace. This is difficult. This will be the hardest part. We can agree on a job guarantee system amongst ourselves, we're all progressives. We can agree on what to do with uh, you know, investment and so on. Uh, but we have a, bag, a lot of baggage when it comes to foreign defense policy and all that. So okay. let me give you an example. A few weeks ago, Donald Trump, in his infinite humanity and wisdom, bombed Syria. And along with him, of course, we had Theresa May and Emmanuel Macron. One of our partners in France supported the bombings. That was like poison to the rest of us. So oh. what we did, we met in Lisbon, oh. and we spent about eight hours together, hammered out a common position that in the end oh. covered for this. But, okay, they were very ready to compromise. It will be difficult, but it is absolutely essential to have a policy that is in favor of open borders, when it comes to migrants, when it comes to refugees, against military, uh, militarism, and against the new tendency in Europe to create under the guise of a common army, which of course we can't have and we shouldn't have. How can you ever have a common army when you don't have a common government? Who, who orders them to war? <laughs> who? Huh? Uh, but it's part of the attempt to build a military industrial complex in, in Europe. And we're against that. Our partners in France have a certain problem because a lot of their trade unions members support it. Like in Britain, for instance, you have trade unions supporting that stupid nuclear deterrent. Uh, but, you know, it's work in progress. We'll get there. I'm looking, Ibrahim, I ha you had your hand up, but you took it down. Go ahead. You told us upstairs that you don't want to lecture us, but I, I do want to push you for advice um, in general. A lot of us are from the economics department here, so we're well versed in marketing, political economy, post-game, the economic institutions, approach, et cetera, et cetera. We're not bamboozled by neoclassical economics anymore. We understand it's money power, hegemony, we understand. We're from all around the world. What do we do now when we're done? I mean, if you were to go back in time, you know, the five, <laughs> ten years to be our age, what would you do differently? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't become an economist, I have to tell you. In really? this environment, I would not become an economist. Simply because there are no economics departments today, except this one. Thank you for the plug. And my little old department in Sydney University that still has a little political economy department. Okay. Yeah. And a tiny bit of political economy left in Athens, which is now dying a terrible death as a result of the crisis. You know, I, when I was, when, when I was a, an undergraduate, undergraduate student and then a postgraduate student, there was still space in economics departments for serious intellectual endeavor. I don't see it now. 
so I have no idea. Look, I'm, there's no way I'm going to give you advice. Go out there and fight. You've reached the stage where you're finishing your PhD. Um, subvert the dominant economic paradigm the way we're doing. Uh, but I have to say that what the, the, I usually, as you can see, you know, I, I'm, I'm, my wife is the artist in the family. I'm the bullshit artist in the family. <laughs> I don't have a problem speaking. But when students say to me, especially good students from my university in Athens, Professor, what should, should I do? Should I do a master's in economics or a PhD in economics? That's when I have a major moral internal crisis. <laughs> because I can't really bring myself to say to them, do it. Do what? Go into a standard department and spend, you know, lose your soul for four or five years doing rubbish and modeling. And then in order to do what? The best you can, you can do is either then work for a bank which is going to use your expertise in order to cover up the very convoluted forms of debt they create in order to, def to defraud the, the, their customers. Yeah? Uh, or to, to do what? Work for the OECD? You go to the, yeah. Take the o OECD, the organization huh? in, in Paris, which is, which is a relic of the Marshall Plan. You even have, the, I'm mentioning the OECD because unlike the IMF, which we know what the IMF is, the OECD has uh, Secretary General Angel Gurria, the former finance minister of Mexico, was a very nice man, actually. Uh, he's quite progressive, and he, he, he would fit in much more than at the new school at, at, at MIT. Yeah. And you go to their economics department, and they're the worst of the worst. And, he, you know, he, the, the, the Secretary General of the OECD comes to, used to come to me, because we, we've known each other for a while, and say, can you furnish me with some arguments against my economists? <laughs> I don't know. Did you ever go ahead, please? Well, my advice would be, uh, and I think they understand it, they don't need me to tell them, that it is absolutely important to do in the global south what we are trying to do in Europe, to create transnational movements. Take, for instance, Latin America. Yeah? I, Latin America is in desperate need of democracy in the Americas movement. And it would be wonderful if our progressive comrades here on this side of the US-Mexican border joined up with them. Yeah. This is one of my criticisms of Bernie Sanders. He's not looking beyond the borders of America. He must. I mean, he is spiritually and so on, but not organizationally. It's important to extend our organizations across borders, because as I was saying before, the bankers are very good at that. We're the only ones who are not good at Oof. that. And so it's essential to do this, to create, to, to, to move away from an antagonistic um, relationship let's say between India and China, between, you have to understand there's no such thing as India. There's no such thing as China. There are many Chinas, there are many Indias. Progressives must bring together the progressive movements from the different uh, countries and economic blocks in, of the global south and create uh, a new movement which uh, puts the interests of the ones that effectively are being liquidated as economic units, whether they are workers or small business people in your countries. In the, yeah, in the back. You. because by tying it together. So it's interesting to see the upheaval here. The, story, the Germany is really pulling, pulling, pulling in upheaval as well. So I, I just find it interesting. That, would you have a, any comment on that, or was that something that my great uncles were kind of... You know, <laughs> well, your great uncles were, were correct, but the, 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 the average German felt that even more than the average Dutch. I have, when I want to be humorful about the Euro, I tell a story as to why it was put together. Um, let me tell you what it is. It's a silly story. It's not true. Analytically, it doesn't hold water, but it's fun anyway. Uh, and it does have some, some insights. Uh, the euro was created because the French 
feared the Germans. The Spanish wanted to be like the French. The Portuguese did not want to be Spanish. The Greeks did not want to be Turkish. The North Italians wanted to be German. The Southern Italians, um, it was the only way of not being kicked out of Italy. Uh, and so on and so forth. In, in the end, OK, Holland had already become German. Uh, part of Belgium wanted to be French, and the other wanted to be Dutch. Uh, but they both, both parts wanted the Deutschmark. And so on and so forth, and it, my story finishes, and because the Germans feared the Germans. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah. there is an element of truth. There in is. Please. And maybe we might have to make this the last one. Maybe we'll go one, two. First of all, thank you very much for coming here today. Um, I'm a fellow Greek. I fall under the demographic of the young people who left the country. <coughs> Uh, so, Minister, I have two questions, really quickly. Ma the, the first question called is... Them. He called them. <laughs> <laughs> I did uh, remark that. So, the first question has to do with what do you think about capital controls? Uh, they are still there, they are still present, and they still have the worst effect on people's lives there. And my second question has to do with what do you think about the containment policy that our government has instituted with regards to the refugees uh, on the islands of... Lesbos, Hios, and just containing refugees there. I'll start from the second. I will repeat yeah. the question. The, first, the second question was, what do we think about the containment policy of the Greek government vis-a-vis -vis the refugees on the islands of Lesbos, Hios, and so on? It's um, a complete and utter disgrace. I'm ashamed to be a Greek, and I'm ashamed to be a European. Mind you, it's not a policy that was put together by the Greek government. Uh, there is no such thing as a Greek government. There are people occupying the ministries, but the government of Greece is effectively uh, orchestrated from Brussels. This policy that you mentioned is just one example. Not, I mean, every single bill that goes through Greek parliament is written in Brussels, and sometimes it's translated through Google Translate. That's why members of parliament <laughs> don't even understand what it says, yeah? And vote for them. Um, no, seriously, seriously, when I was in parliament, I received a 1,000-page bill that was Google translated. <laughs> no, I'm not joking. Right? 15th of August, 2015. It's remarkable. Um, Google Translate has gotten better in the last three years. <laughs> uh, but let me say t t just a few words so that the rest of you understand what has happened with the refugees in Lesbos and here. Uh, the European Union has um, chosen to bribe an increasingly dictatorial Turkish president, Mr. Erdogan, to the tune of six billion euros, about seven billion dollars, uh, so that Erdogan would allow the European Union to violate international law on refugees. So if you are a political refugee from Syria, from Afghanistan, from Pakistan, and you land in Lesbos after a, um, an inhuman trek where you know, the chances of being killed in a variety of ways are gigantic, you end up there and you don't have the right to a hearing that will determine whether you're a political refugee or not. This is the greatest violation. So that's what I think of the second one. The second part was, the first question that was asked was about capital controls. What do we think about them? Yeah. And what else? Yeah, that, that, that was the main question. Okay, capital controls in the European Union, firstly in the Eurozone, are a contradiction in terms. To have a monetary union with capital controls, imagine if you can't take your, your, your dollars uh, from here to Boston. Imagine that. Yeah? You, you can take a certain quantity of them, but no more than that. Then you, what kind of a dollar union do you have? Uh, there is no economic rationale for them whatsoever. They are used in the Eurozone as an instrument of discipline, of disciplining wayward governments. Uh, so the only reason why they were introduced in Greece in 2015 was because a government was elected that wanted to renegotiate the debt. So they slapped them on, and they will continue to slap them on and as long as they think that it is possible that this government or the next government will uh, again raise the issue. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the excuse for the capital controls was a capital flight, capital flight, uh, a bank run. And there was a bank run. But why was there a bank run? Because a month before we were elected, the governor of the Bank of Greece, of our Fed, came out and made a fantastic statement, which I think is a unique statement in the history of central banking, predicting a liquidity crisis. <laughs> what? It's like the 
firefighters starting a fire. Uh, it's very easy to do. Yeah? You know the standard joke, there are two rich people on the golf course. You know that, Stephen, don't you? <laughs> it's my favorite one regarding this. this and one of them says, oh, you know, you know how, my, how I made money. I had a factory and I burnt it down and I got the insurance money. And the other guy said, yes, me, me too. Similarly, uh, there was a flood and I got the insurance money. And the guy goes, how did you start the flood? <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> the way they started the flood was to say, it's going to be a liquidity crisis. Then money starts coming out. And then saying, oh, if this continues, we will have to slap capital controls. Really? So, of course, the, cap the, the, the bank ran uh, accelerated, and then they slapped capital controls. All they had to do is to say, we guarantee the deposits that there will be no liquidity, no liquidity shortage. Then there would be no capital flight, and then there would be no capital controls. It was a, a pure instrument of exercising authority over a democratically elected government. I just want to let you know there's a signing table over there, which I presume means that Giannis is going to sit down and sign books, talking to my daughter about the economy or how capitalism works and how it fails. And then new in paperback, <laughs> adults in the room, my battle with the European and American deep establishment, incredible erudition, analytics, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you.